Good evening and welcome. Tonight, um, we have a reschedule from March's community meeting. We have Annette Bradshaw visiting us today to talk to us more about neurofeedback. Um, thank you, Annette, for being so flexible and coming and sharing all this information with our members. Thank you, Melissa. So are we ready to start? We are ready. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about neurofeedback tonight and thank you for having me and I hope that this is helpful. It's going to be a bit of a ride, but <laughs> we'll get there and uh, get clarification to at the end with your questions. And um, I've been providing neurofeedback as uh, one of my services for a few years now. I'm a registered psychotherapist and I actually personally experienced neurofeedback and found it really helpful. And that's what made me want to start studying it and learning it and providing this service uh, to others. And I have provided it to a lot of clients and it's been helpful in uh, in many ways for many conditions, but we'll get into those, those details. So we're gonna talk about uh, what neurofeedback is and how it can help. And um, just starting with some uh, few little facts because the brain is definitely a really interesting field and it's been exploding in the last few decades and we keep learning more and more um, about how awesome it is <laughs> and basically how important it is. The brain keeps your body running all day long. Uh, your brain helps you think and learn new things. Uh, our brain also controls movement and speech. And very importantly, our brain is part of the central nervous system. And so it's a whole system. The brain communicates through to the body that through the nervous system and vice versa. And then some uh, facts of interest. Uh, the average adult human brain weighs about three pounds. It's about the size of a large grapefruit. And it has a texture like firm jelly sitting in a fluid that helps protect and cushion it. And there are hundreds of billions of cells in the brain. There's a thousand types of cells and over a hundred chemicals. And there's a lot of big numbers. If you want all the details of what's going on in the brain, it's the best organized three pounds of matter in the universe. And also neuroplasticity, uh, that's a term you've probably heard, and that refers to the changes that occur in the structure and organization of the brain as a result of experience. So basically, uh, we're learning based on our experiences and our practice. So if you're, it goes both ways in a positive sense and also in a negative sense. If you keep repeating negative thoughts or negative uh, behaviors or habits, then your brain is gonna start wiring and firing that way. It's gonna create patterns in the brain that enable that. Um, if you're working on positive learning, then you can start to train your brain and optimize your brain function. And of course, neurofeedback is a tool that helps with that. Um, that we'll continue to uh, explain as we go along. And basically your brain activity is as unique as your fingerprints. So in doing brain training, we're not trying to um, make your brain look a certain way and make everybody's brain look the same way. And it's not going to happen. Basically, you know, we get information about what your brain activity is and help you learn how to improve that. And then things will change in your brain, but that'll be unique to you. And the important part is the, your day-to-day -day experience of how that's helped. And this is just a really basic um, brain anatomy, just the major main parts of the brain. Um, the red is frontal lobe. So that's in the front, um, it's called, often called the central executive network. That's the area where the neuroplasticity is the greatest. Um, and that's the area that's uh, developed last. So it's, you know, uh, early to mid twenties before that central executive network is, is pretty strong. And that's uh, the area where we have planning and organizing. Um, and you can tell by that term, central executive network, um, uh, strategizing that, you know, that's the role there. 
the yellow area, the parietal lobe, that's uh, the back of the brain, that's where there's um, sensory input. Um, and that's an area that, you know, if sens sensory input is overwhelming, we might experience anxiety uh, or overwhelm from that. Below that is the occipital lobe that's related to uh, vision. And tucked under there is the cerebellum, which is related more to uh, motor function and balance. And uh, on the side, the temporal lobe, so that's above our ears on the side, that's the uh, emotional regulation. So on the left side's um, uh, anger and the right side is uh, anxiety. And uh, you also see the spinal cord there because that's important. Of course, that's the only place that the brain is connected. It's connected to the spinal cord. Um, but at the top, uh, there's no other areas where it's actually connected to the skull as you saw in that earlier fact it's um, surrounded by fluid and it's just protected that way so when there's um, a hit an injury then you know the brain slides around in the skull and that's that's how it gets injured bumping up against the skull um, it's one other thing, yeah. So about this image, this is also just to show you that um, when we do the neurofeedback, the sensors um, can be placed in different areas depending on what we're working on. So if we're working on anxiety, there might be a sensor in that parietal lobe, on the parietal lobe. Um, when we're working with uh, focus and attention, ADD kind of symptoms, um, we might have a sensor on the um, frontal lobe. Uh, and the temporal lobe around uh, emotional regulation. So that's part of the reason I put that, uh, this image up. And basically our brain is making brain waves all the time and our brain waves are um, different frequencies, uh, different speeds. So we have slow brain waves um, all the way up to really fast brain waves and, and you know, mix, of course, um, by day and by night. At night, we have more slow waves um, because that's helpful for sleep. And uh, the brain waves are measured in Hertz. So that's cycles per second, if you remember your physics. <laughs> and we have brain waves at all frequencies, zero Hertz, one Hertz, two Hertz, and everything in between and all the way up. Um, and what was done uh, somewhere in along the way in neuroscience is uh, the brain waves were banded together into frequency bands and given names. And as you can see from the Greek al alphabet. So if you look at the, um, the slowest in the, on this slide, that would be the green delta. So that's below four Hertz. And when we're sleeping, uh, when we're dreaming, when we're in that really deep sleep where we don't, can't even move our body, that's uh, when we're in delta. And the next uh, level is theta, the blue. And again, we have a lot of that when we're sleeping and uh, some when we're meditating, uh, also when we're dreaming, that REM sleep, and also when we're creative. Um, and clients that have are experiencing attention issues, ADD, uh, might have a little bit too much of the delta and theta waves and the neurofeedback goal will be to uh, reduce some of that to help with alertness. And then uh, the yellow is alpha, nine to 13 hertz. That's a very relaxed state, almost drowsy. Um, we can have that when we're relaxed and when we're creative, when we're meditating. Um, and it's a very open, open kind of focus. So um, that kind of equanimity, everything's okay. Not you know, judging everything as, as bad or good, just everything's okay. Um, beta, the uh, goldish brown on the top, uh, 14 to 30 Hertz in during the daytime. That's a really great state to be in. Uh, that's when we're awake and we have, um, uh, calm, alert focus. Uh, so that's a range where in the neurofeedback exercises, the brain gets rewarded for making more of that because that's part of the goal. And in the language of neurofeedback, another really important term is arousal. Um, that means activation. So basically you've probably had the experience of um, 
heightened arousal where you're feeling stressed, you might be feeling shaky or your heart is racing or you're feeling sweaty, you're scared. Um, that's a high arousal, that's the, uh, the pink side. And this graph is looking at arousal and performance. So when you're in that state, um, you know, you probably experienced it's pretty hard to, um, to do something, to do something well, um, because you're too anxious, anxiety, of course, is going to be in that curve. And then on the left side in the yellow, um, that's when arousal is low, that you probably experienced that too, where we're drowsy or we're not made, not motivated, we're lethargic, um, fatigued, and maybe brain fog too. Uh, and it's pretty hard to, um, performance is not going to be very good when we're in that state as well. And then that middle green section is optimal arousal. So that's when we're, you know, we're alert and we're calm and we're focused. And that's when we can really be productive and get things done. And how this relates to neural feedback is uh, when you're training, uh, I mentioned uh, reward earlier. So when the brain is uh, doing an exercise, then it will, there will be rewards for when it's in that green range, that optimal arousal and inhibits, which means um, no reward if the, um, uh, the high arousal is happening. So that's fast wave. Um, so if that's happening too much, um, then that will interfere with the reward or if the slow, there's too much slow wave that will interfere with the reward. Um, so that's how uh, the brain trains for balance, but there'll be more slides that will help to explain that a little bit more. So again, with this arousal model, the things that we look at are um, over arousal, uh, as you saw that, that yellow section. So some people's brains are prone to over arousal. Um, some people's brains are pr prone to under arousal. So a lot of um, slow wave and some unstable that it's um, just that the state is hard to maintain. So their brain is, is shifting too much and they can't maintain the state that they need for that, um, for a particular task. Uh, another example of unstable arousal that applies to sleep would be not being able to stay asleep. So, um, you know, waking up through the night. And disordered arousal is something that is um, in the brain would be, uh, uh, you know, a range or a mix of those things above. So some parts of the brain might be over aroused, some might be under aroused, and there would be some instability there as well. So those are all the different uh, categories that we find um, when we're doing uh, assessment. And I'll be explaining that too. So this funny picture is, <laughs> is a bird's eye view of the top of a head. Uh, you can see the, um, the ears on the side and a uh, little nose on the front. And basically that's called the 1020 map. And um, when EEGs are done, I don't know, some of you might've had an EEG in the past where you've had the cap and electrodes all over your head and they've been measuring your brain waves. We do, um, when we're starting neurofeedback with a client, we do something called a mini map. So we don't measure uh, all of those areas. We actually just look at uh, three main areas and then we do some analysis of that and it gives us a lot of information um, from that. So we do the uh, FZ, CZ and PZ. So that just involves um, sitting in a chair, looking at a screen, but there's no exercise. So you're just relaxed and you have a, an electrode um, on that spot, uh, you know, kind of uh, front from the center of your head there. And uh, one on each ear, one's a ground and one's a reference. And the um, computer will just run what your average um, power is running at that site and we just do that at three sites to get a, a baseline at resting and then um, and then we repeat that every 10 sessions or so so we get to see really quantitatively how things are changing um, so I'll 
just to go to the points on the right, um, when we get started uh, with a new client, uh, we start with personal history, and that's like typical therapy where you know we get a client's background, uh, and then we add medical history, so we get a lot of details about your medical history of um, especially focusing on the brain and the central nervous system, um, and then also a system sorry, a symptom checklist based on your current situation. So what symptoms are you um, struggling with right now? And the mini map, as I said, and we talk about goals and uh, that's something else that we refer to as we go along. We re also repeat uh, that second point there, that checklist as well to see how things progress. And then also do a sample training, a you know, gentle, short training to see how you respond to that. So that's actually our assessment process. And that's our equipment. So that's a picture of the equipment in my office. <laughs> and on the left is the um, is a laptop. That's the therapist's laptop where we set up the, the, um, the program. That's why the butterfly, that's yeah, EEG program right there. And the therapist sets up the client's um, information about uh, the parameters of the training, what game is going to be done, what the challenge level will be, what the training time will be. That's where we set it all up. And then the monitor on the right is what the client views. And that list of things there are some of the games that we have. So that's where the actual game and activity will run. So basically on that laptop, as a therapist, I'm seeing your brain waves like an EEG. But on the right, as a client, you're seeing instead of the squiggly EEG, you're seeing that transformed into images, uh, which will change based on how your brain changes. So that's the, the real interesting part. It's more fun to see that. <laughs> and the right bottom of that photo there is a little amplifier. And you can see that there's something plugged in there. That's the electrodes. So they're plugged in the box and then on the tissue there, is the, um, the part of the electrode that goes on your scalp. It's just a, at the end, a little silver disc um, that we put some paste on that's conductive, conducts the signal and um, you know holds it on your scalp and basically is reading the brain's activity underneath the scalp. There's no signal going in. Uh, it's just reading what's there. It's just uh, information for us. So it's not doing anything to your brain. This whole process is about learning, about your brain learning based on feedback, seeing what it's doing and what it feels like when it changes. So, and Um, so that's uh, a couple of activities, exercises. I'll talk about the one on the left. It's called Island. Sorry, it's blurry. It was hard to get that, make an image like that happen. But um, so that one's called Island. There's like a, an island in the distance and a, a, a night sky and a moon and the water and these colors. Um, so basically, as I mentioned before, that's the EEG showing up in these images. So um, in another format. So the blue line stretched across the bottom is the reward band. And that would be, you know, typically some part of a beta range or sometimes alpha which um, the brain is being encouraged to make more of, to be in that state. And basically, as the brain does make more of it, then there will be a reward in the form of um, an audio reward, which is a beep. So a beep will sound. And also a visual, a bird will pop in the sky. So at the same time as the beep, the bird pops in the sky. And that's the, uh, the reward function. And as I mentioned before, there's also inhibits. So like that arousal graph, the one on the right, uh, the yellow box is uh, representing the uh, high beta it's called. So those are the fast brain waves. And when you're making um, too much of the fast brain waves, it's, it's hard to be relaxed and alert. So, that um, the parameters are set up, the box size is set up to 
reinforce your brain to keep that number low. So if you're having trouble doing that, then that box will get bigger, you know, while you're doing the exercise um, and your brain will get that feedback um, to bring that into range and learn how to do that. And then the left side is the pink box is the uh, slow wave. So that delta or theta that we have when we're sleeping and we don't really want to have when we're awake, not too much of at least. Uh, so that's another inhibit, another um, training to keep that to keep that number down. So if you know both those extremes are down and that optimal range is coming up, then you know that helps us achieve that optimal um, optimal state that we want. And then sitting down and doing this exercise um, every week and adding uh, adding time, making it longer, adding a challenge level, making that you know, box smaller and smaller so you keep learning how to bring that down are all things that help the brain learn. Just like if you were learning a new language, you have to practice, you have to repeat, it has to keep getting more difficult for you to progress. Um, so it's basically a learning tool that way. And this is um, what the therapist screen looks like. So you saw the, that image of the exercise um, for the client, but what the therapist is looking at is this. So these are your brain waves real time. And that top band would be that um, uh, slow inhibit, that pink box. So that's what's really going on. Um, uh, so you can see when, it, when the wave gets bigger there, near that red line, that's, you know, what the client would be seeing is that pink box getting bigger because that number is going up. Now uh, that brain wave is going up and we're trying to bring it back down. The middle one is the reward and that blue line. And then the bottom one is the, um, the fast wave, the yellow, the yellow box. And as a therapist, I, you know, I watch how it's going real time because what the, the equipment is doing is it's going to run an average of how you were doing through that exercise, uh, which you will see, we will talk about afterwards. So it gives us some average numbers. So it keeps taking averages every several seconds. Um, but here I get to see real time. So sometimes the average number you know, might look a little bit higher than what I was noticing because, you know, because of averages, there were periods of time where you're doing really well and periods of time where it might have been going out. So then it just, you know, the number looked somewhere in between. So I can give you more detailed feedback based on what I see real time. Okay, so back to uh, bigger picture, <laughs> how neurofeedback helps. And these are some examples, but this is what I've been talking about all along. Um, the slow waves, as I mentioned, as an inhibit, what something we try to reduce. Um, and when you've, you're learning to reduce those slow waves, then you're gonna experience more clarity and focus, and you're gonna experience less um, sleepiness and brain fog, which is something that, you know, a goal people have for during the day when they're trying to get get work done and uh, on the other side if we reduce the excess fast wave that's called the high beta then again we can reduce tension and anxiety and help to be more relaxed and calm and then using that uh, reward feature in neurofeedback we can increase uh, alpha or beta and have um, allow for practice of a more calm alert focus so those kinds of protocols uh, increase the stability of brain waves um, because you're getting balanced by making all those changes and reduces reactivity. So reactivity, both emotional and physiological. And overall balance, stability and flexibility of the brain uh, leads to optimal performance. And you know, people ask, well, what are the things that uh, neurofeedback can help with? And these are some of the things that neurofeedback has helped with. And we continue to do studies and um, see results and explore um, uh, other conditions and see results. So the list has been growing. Um, so we have ADD, ADHD on the list, autism, anxiety and panic attacks, uh, trauma and PTSD, migraines, eating disorders, OCD, fears and phobias, um, sleep issues, sensitivities and reactivity, 
and uh, of course seizures, TBI, um, concussions, basic self-regulation, um, stress and fatigue, uh, addictions. Yeah, I'm not sure what that one is in the corner, but uh, hopefully you can see it. I have our images in the way, but. Um, and also, uh, you know, clients struggling with any of these conditions might be wanting to try neurofeedback, but neurofeedback is also used uh, for optimizing performance. So it's also been used in the world of um, entertainment and sports, um, Olympic teams, uh, professional athletes, um, musicians, um, so, uh, and others have used neurofeedback to um, increase and improve their performance. So it has a lot of applications. And when we start neurofeedback, um, we also, you know, advise that of course the results are going to be better if you're having a healthy lifestyle. It's just like if you are, um, trying to improve your your health physically you're going to the gym to work out you know it's important that you don't um, uh, sabotage that by you know getting a box of donuts on the way home kind of thing so um, so we look for uh, or advise that you try to get the best sleep that you can sometimes sleep is the issue that we're, we're working on but the best sleep that you can and uh, exercise um, because that brings oxygen to the brain. And I even notice when the client will come in to train, if they've exercised before that, uh, the results are better. Um, and a uh, healthy diet. So of course, eating healthy foods and uh, again, also feeds the brain and keeps, keeps it healthy as, as well as the whole body. And some takeaways from that um, related to the, the healthy lifestyle that helps us, the neurofeedback uh, results you know, be even better. Uh, those are things that we know about our life in any case. Those are all things we know for stress management. And those are all things that are super important right now during this pandemic and uh, things that we can do to help ourselves, to help calm our nervous system, to help um, balance uh, our health and well being. So sleep, of course, is very important. And, you know, things like, um, you know, having good sleep hygiene, you know, turning off the screens before you, you know, well before you go to bed, maybe doing some reading before bed to kind of quiet your mind. And again, you know, not have that blue light from the screens, um, not having caffeine before you sleep. Um, you know, maybe having some nice relaxing music, making sure the room is dark and not too hot and um, lots of things you can do to help facilitate a good, good night's sleep. Also exercise and movement. Um, you know, we can't go to the gym right now, but lots of people are going out for walks and any kind of movement. Um, there's lots of online classes of sorts to do uh, exercise at home, um, yoga, even you know, crank up a song you like and dance to it, any kind of move, movement, uh, getting up and taking breaks um, from the screen and also healthy diets. So um, you know, many people have told me they've um, been doing a lot more cooking during the pandemic because they have the time and, um, and we can't go to restaurants except for takeout. So I know it's, it's a good time to uh, eat healthy and eat balanced meals, and take care of ourselves that way. And as I said, reducing screen time, I know it's hard for people working from home that uh, that, that is their work, but as I said, taking breaks, you know, making sure you take, you know, take your lunch break totally away from that, go for a walk, you know, don't, you know, sit in front of your screen and eat your lunch. Um, and then also um, reducing back to the, the food choices, reducing sugar, alcohol, and caffeine. Um, I mean, they're all things that can change our state temporarily. Of course, sugar makes us feel good, but then we can crash afterwards. And alcohol makes us, you know, feel like everything's okay, gives us some of that alpha. Um, but again, temporarily. And if that's um, something, a habit that gets used to feel good um, on a regular basis, the long-term effect of that is it actually lowers your alpha. So then, you know, at some point you can end up feeling depressed. Um, and caffeine, uh, same thing, like 
that's a stimulant, of course, so that helps to give us some focus, um, but then it also can uh, make us too activated. So uh, people that are sensitive to caffeine get the jitters and it's not, <laughs> it's not um, a solution either. So, you know, all of these other items, taking care of yourself, that can help with the balance that you might not need to reach for those short-term fixes. Um, healthy relationships, of course, those, those are important. So, you know, doing whatever you can to you know, communicate in a healthy way with your loved ones, the people that you're living with, and um, try to have each other as a, as a, as a support. Uh, reducing your stress, and again, all these tools here um, will help to reduce your stress. And um, just also remembering not to take more on, like, you know, think twice about what you might say yes to if it's going to be uh, an overload to your, your workload and cause more stress. Learning new things, anything, anything. It can be anything fun, um, anything, even easy things. Just getting that variety, that kind of uh, intellectual stimulation of learning is, is great. And play and creativity, uh, of course, you know, playing with your pets, playing with your kids, um, you know, just doing some easy fun stuff that you might be interested in, in picking up in your spare time. Uh, something creative, the nice weather, maybe gardening as well. And then um, meditation, of course, is, is wonderful and mindfulness. Some people feel like meditation is too hard for them, but meditation doesn't just mean sitting on a pillow, um, being able to have an empty brain, because that's very, very hard. <laughs> it's true. Um, just meditation takes many forms, just being focused and present um, with the things that you're doing during the day, being focused and present when you're getting dressed or when you're uh, eating your meal or when you're brushing your teeth. Just make sure that you're present and having the experience and not just lost in your thoughts and, um, and missing everything. So that, that's what really helps us to focus. And journaling has been shown to be a really great tool as well for helping to, um, to process, uh, process our experiences. And, um, and there's probably other things I could add to that list or you might be doing that are helpful that aren't on that list, but that's, that's the start. So in review, um, uh, Yes, I couldn't see my actual little side notes to the slide, so I might have missed a couple of things I wanted to talk about. So uh, what I didn't say at the beginning, that's right here now, is neurofeedback um, it gets uh, used by a few different terms get used to describe neurofeedback. Sometimes it's called biofeedback for the brain. Sometimes it's called brain training. So if you see those terms, then know that that's the same thing as neurofeedback. And in review, uh, your brain learns to do better with feedback. Um, you know, there are other consumer products out there that have a technical, um, uh, that are technology that claim to, um, you know, help you focus better, uh, relax, different things like that. Um, they just, because they don't give the extent, the complexity of the feedback that something like uh, this system does. Um, they're not going to help, you know, quite as much. I mean, they can be fun and they can have some benefit, but um, yeah, I guess the other example is just screen time, right? You know, watching TV, yes, it seems relaxing, but you know that, you know, we are zoning out when we're watching TV. We are, we do have a lot of slow wave and um, we're not really learning a lot. If it's a documentary, we might be learning some information, but we're not learning about our brain and our state. Um, uh, because we don't we don't have the feedback that um, that the neural feedback in a clinic offers. So, and learning to alter the EEG improves self regulation of brain waves and brain state. And as you saw from that previous slide that showed the EEG, you know that's actually what's happening in those exercises. You are altering your EEG, and your brain is experiencing um, the changes uh, when it's making the changes. You're experiencing the changes in your day to day life, and um, your brain finds that this uh, the new patterns are more efficient, and they require less energy and basically the brain is a lazy organ and it likes that so it will continue to uh, in those patterns that are more efficient. 
And when your brain is better regulated, you function better. As we saw from that arousal and performance slide. And neurofeedback benefits people of all ages. So there are, um, there are clinics that specialize in working with children and a very common um, uh, application of neurofeedback for children is ADD. And um, also I, I haven't been working with children. I have worked with some teenagers and, and then adults and then I've worked with the elderly as well. So there's benefits for people of all ages. It's not hard to do, it's gentle, it's non-invasive, it's, um, you know, it's kind of fun. Like it, people do enjoy it. No one says, oh, I really hated that. <laughs> no one says, I don't want to come back. <laughs> so um, it is enjoyable. And it's a non-invasive alternative to medication. Uh, so the difference is medication, you know, works on the, um, the chemistry of the brain. Uh, the brain is also an electrochemical organ. So uh, neurofeedback works on the electricity and the energy of the brain. And basically it's, it's a learning method. So the brain learns how to change. And as a result of that, it changes, it um, changes all those symptoms. It improves all those symptoms that, that uh, you've been struggling with. And after the neurofeedback is finished, uh, there's been studies that have shown that the results can keep improving. Uh, for some people, the results keep improving. For others, you know, they stay improved. Um, and for some people, they have to come back and do a little bit more, not start back at the beginning, but um, do kind of like a tune-up because if there's been a serious infection, maybe a really big trauma or something, you know, um, that's changed, that's, uh, you know, they might want to come back and, and address that. And the other thing about medication is our brain becomes dependent on it. So when you stop taking the medication, all of the symptoms come back again. And that's what I was saying with um, the learning model. That's, that's not going to happen. And as you saw in the previous slide, there's a wide range of conditions that can be helped with neurofeedback. And also um, in our center, well, a lot of centers combine neurofeedback with psychotherapy. So it's not just that you go in and you sit down and you um, do the, the training and play the games. Um, we talk about uh, what's happened since the last session, um, how things are progressing and in detail because sometimes we need to alter frequencies. With this, the program is very customized for you and based on the results that you're experiencing, uh, we make changes as we go along to improve on the progress. And um, having that history in the beginning, we know what the issues are that you're working with and how they're affecting your life in, in always. So we work together on making changes in your life uh, using tools and uh, trying to reach those goals and uh, applying the changes that you're learning by doing the brain training in your life to get the best improvement. So the treatment can lead to a long lasting change and balance in your life. Thank you. I hope I covered everything. <laughs> I know I probably worked out everybody's brains, worked out my brain too. And that's a picture of my uh, the office door, but that's a banner that uh, matches our business cards. We started a website a year ago, just before the pandemic. <laughs> um, so my contact information is next and that has the website there. We've got changing waves, neurofeedback and psychotherapy. Um, if you check out that website, though, uh, there is information, of course, about neurofeedback and psychotherapy, so it will be a bit of a refresher, so it might help to um, uh, explain things a little bit more, help you understand things a little bit more, because just like doing neurofeedback, we need this repetition to understand this, because it's pretty um, complicated to, uh, to explain and get to um, understand. It's very experiential. You know, the clients understand it as they go along because I explain as everything as we go along. Um, you see the results of every training session afterwards and all of the uh, uh, in-between um, measurements that we do. So you really end up learning a lot about your brain and your own nervous system and experience from doing that. And I'll also mention that um, 
there are a few of us doing uh, neurofeedback at the center. Uh, however, with the pandemic, we all um, went to move to doing our psychotherapy online and taking a break from the neurofeedback. And then um, in July 2020, when things opened up a bit, I went back to the office to do some in-person neurofeedback. And I am still doing that. I am the only one, though, still doing that. Um, uh, hopefully it'll be soon that my colleagues colleagues return and I'm doing it with all of the safety measures, infection control. It's not very many clients, um, lots of time in between sessions, lots of cleaning and <laughs> um, keeping us safe. So. Thank so you so much, Annette. Um, I think maybe if you want, we can leave your information up for a bit. Um, for everybody who's watching, as you know, it's um, being recorded. So this information will be available um, to you to recall. Um, I think it's, that was amazing actually. And it's a very holistic approach. Um, mm -hmm. Even the, the concept of, of changing the way that your, your brain responds to stimulation and being able to, I guess, harness or control your brain patterning is just, it's incredible. Yeah, and, 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 you know, the word control, um, you know, we like to use, while well, there's terms in uh, learning theory, right, there's the term mm -hmm. of um, reinforcement, there's the term of, uh, there's classical conditioning, there's operant conditioning, there's that term shaping, which is most yeah. relevant, right, we're actually shaping, we're coaxing your brain to, you know, make a little less of this and a little more of that, and we're shaping a new pattern. And then, and then our brain learns, um, learns to do that and gets reinforcement for doing that. And then um, it helps, helps make changes at home when you're not doing the training um, and it feels good. So, you, you know, you're holistically getting reinforced. Your mind likes what's happening and your mind can make those changes because your brain's not getting in the way because it's starting to be in a pattern that's conducive to those healthier ways of being. So it all works together. Yeah. yeah. That's actually what I was thinking when you were um, talking a bit, which is the, uh, it's that, that whole classical conditioning, you know, um, but it's, it's interesting when you, when you think about the difference between external conditioning and um, what almost seems like to be internal conditioning, where you have a little bit of that, um, the ability to, to do that within yourself, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I, I think that that's very interesting and very uh... yeah, and it's interesting in the sessions too because it, it you know it, it's it's interesting to explain because you know there's our mind and our brain and you know one thing I like to explain is you know when we're in therapy and we start to learn about you know what we're struggling with and why and what the causes are and what the mm -hmm. patterns are and you know we know where we want to go and the changes we want to make and we're struggling to make them it's just not happening that's because you know we're using our willpower but um our brain isn't on on uh, on the same page because we might be you know really anxious and that's what's in the way and we can't make those changes mm -hmm. until we can calm down our brain and then we can make those changes but even when uh, clients are doing the exercises when you're doing the training our mind automatically wants to oh i want more beeps right <laughs> what can mm -hmm. i do beeps or why is that box too big you know i oh i must be you know i'll, I'll breathe differently or i'll <laughs> do this or that right we're trying to figure out what to do but actually when you can just really just set your intention that your brain's going to get the feedback it needs and knows what to do with it you don't have to do anything except you know pay attention be present and it'll happen and it does so and then you get to experience that difference too it's it's quite interesting mm -hmm. I think it's amazing too how you combine um, both neurofeedback and psychotherapy as one um, I guess treatment plan you know what I mean like as opposed to just one or the other but they, they do um, go hand in hand yeah we see the neurofeedback as a tool for psychotherapy mm -hmm. okay we have a whole bunch of questions that have rolled in um, are you ready? <laughs> so I have, um, one of our members has asked, what percentage of patients are significantly improved according to the EEG in 10 sessions? And is this reflected 
reflected in changes in their anxiety or whatever factor was being worked on in real life. Okay, I'm not sure about the second half of that question, but um, so basically um, it, it's a high percentage. Um, I can't give you an actual number, except maybe if I look at the time frame, like returning in the middle of the pandemic in July till now, like I had some new clients start and I had some return and um, a mix and of that mix in any case, um, there was uh, one person there was only one client who felt that it wasn't it wasn't working for him, and and it didn't make anything worse, of course. But there was just um, the changes weren't holding. Like there'd be some changes where he thought, okay, you know, we're on the right track, things are going well, but then it would go off again. So then we'd make some more changes. He was making a lot of changes on his own too in, in his lifestyle. So that, you know, it's hard to measure when you've got that happening too. But um, yeah, it's just you know, it's hard to know. If, for sure, but it just seemed like he might not have been a candidate that um, that this works for. So there are some people that it doesn't work for, but it, it isn't a very large number. But, mm -hmm. And then uh, that question about anxiety. Um, yes, that, I mean, a change in anxiety would definitely be because of the neurofeedback. I mean, I do have other tools that I recommend um, for people with anxiety that are doing neurofeedback to even add, to help even more, but it's usually, you know, the neurofeedback that, that is um, doing the work because it's about um, calming those fast waves. And actually that is one of the uh, easier pieces of the neurofeedback. That's kind of one of the first things that, that happens because uh, we've learned that the brain is, um, it's easiest for the brain to reduce um, fast waves than it is to reduce slow waves. So if you're experiencing mm. both of those, if you're experiencing people with trauma often experience anxiety plus depression plus uh, ADD type symptoms, um, that's, that's that disordered arousal pattern. So it's a little bit of everything. And then we have trauma protocols. And when they start working, then the first thing that they notice is an improvement in the anxiety, because that's because for the brain, that is the easiest thing to do is to get the fast wave down, um, and, and then get some stability in. And, um, what's a little bit harder is getting the slow wave down. So that's kind of the, the next level. Um, something that's a little bit harder is getting numbers up. But I don't have too many clients that come where their numbers are too low. <laughs> Most people, you know, their their brains are overactive. Their brains are on fire, or one foot, so, you know, yeah. Basically, I'll, I'll just say that, and you know, and that's easier. That's actually easier to work with, even mm. though it's you know, it'll be making your life hell. <laughs> <laughs> I had one uh, where um, the first thing that happened was her panic attack stopped. Because again, wow. that's the most extreme of fast waves, and uh, is to for it to actually go to a panic attack, and 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 that was a bit um, disarming for her because you know she knew all the time all the things that would you know lead to a panic attack, right? So that would you know the thing would come up and there wouldn't be a panic attack, you know something would come up there wouldn't be a panic attack. No word of my panic wow. attack. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. I mean, I guess especially when you're used to that. Uh, that pattern and behavior and suddenly it's it's not there yeah but fantastic it takes a little bit to trust that okay this has really changed right yeah. yeah um i have a few people asking i'm just gonna combine some i have a few people asking about um coverage they're asking about um if treatment is covered by OHIP and if it's safe for long-term use. So can you be doing biofeedback for uh, a long duration? Right. Um, so it's not covered um, by OHIP. Well, it's because the, pra um, the practitioners in this clinic aren't covered by OHIP. So if you were to do neurofeedback with a um, uh, GP psychotherapist or a psychiatrist, then it would be covered by OHIP. Unfortunately, I don't know anyone um, that's doing that. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I don't know, like if hospitals were to, to get into this, but uh, you, I'm a registered psychotherapist, so I am covered by some benefit plans that have extended health care. So, some uh, employers um, have. Uh, 
uh, counseling as a benefit and then you know then they have requirements right you could see a registered psychologist or some will allow a registered psychotherapist or a registered social worker there are social workers doing this as well um, so yeah so unfortunately it's not covered by OHIP so um, it would be under benefits if you have those benefits and otherwise it's it's out of pocket and you know we can um, you know, for a few clients that, and especially during this pandemic, there's people in this scenario um, that are unemployed or students or uh, don't have insurance, they're paying out of pocket that we can do a sliding scale, um, but we just have to balance that ourselves. Like we can't have everybody in a sliding scale, but we have to, you know, be able to manage as well. So we could, you know, have a few spots uh, available like that. Um, and the long-term use, uh, so basically, oh, sorry, and that last question asked about 10 sessions. Um, basically, that first 10 sessions, we do, I mentioned we repeat the mini-map and the checklist and that to see how the progress is. Um, it's not very often that we would only do 10 sessions um, because it's just that the, there will be some improvements noticed by then, but they're not going to hold yet because of learning, right? If you're learning, you know, a new language and you do 10 lessons, you're probably not going to be able to, you know, really speak fluently and everything. Right? Yeah, you need, you need more time. So uh, uh, the brain needs more time for that to really be reinforced and be something that's going to, um, to last. So, um, so then, you know, after 10 sessions, you notice, you know, some of the changes and then, in 20 sessions, we repeat everything and, you know, there's usually some progress. There might be some changes in um, when we're repeating those mini maps in protocols after that. Again, it's very specific to your brain and what's going on for you. So once, you know, something that's easier to change is, is in good shape, then we can see more of what else is going on. And there might be another area that we're working on next and changing up the protocols or something. So, uh, so then that takes, you know, takes us to 20 sessions, but you will be really experiencing some, some experiencing some good self -reg regulation by that point. Um, and some clients, because people often ask for those numbers, right, might take up to 40 sessions for, you know, to get through all the protocols that, that they will need and for the changes to last. Um, and the sessions might be spread out a bit near the end, just so that we can see that, you know, how long the results are lasting, that they are holding for sure. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of an average number we put out there is 40 sessions, um, but for some people it could be a little less, for some people it might be more. Um, but then, you know, beyond that, I like to be doing this for a couple of years on a regular basis. Um, I haven't done that with any clients because they haven't actually needed that. So I don't know if there'd be any harm. They probably just plateau, probably wouldn't really experience anything new, um, you know, much that's changed continue to go like that yeah mm -hmm. one of our members asked um so i guess they're just curious about um, what it looks like to be doing neurofeedback and the person has asked yeah. so how are you doing this watching images on a screen yeah i know that part was uh, that's why i tried to take the the picture of our equipment so i could explain it that way but again still it's, it's hard to imagine so um when you saw yeah the equipment you saw the sensors so as i um, mentioned on the slides so there'll be a sensor you know a sensor on your scalp and sensors on your ears and they're plugged into the amplifier and then those eeg lines that i'm seeing on my laptop are actually what's being read what's below that sensor. Um, and then that's being transformed by the computer into that screen that the client's looking at. And that example I gave of that game with the water and those two boxes in the line, that's actually those brain waves being put into that, turned into a picture. So based on how much of the, the one band that you're making, that's the size of that box. And that's the size of the other box based on what your, your brain is producing while you're sitting there. And you're actually just, yes, just watching the screen. That's the amazing part of it. And things are changing. There's no controls. You're not doing anything. You're just watching the screen. And, um, and you know, relaxing and breathing and being curious about the screen. And, you're, you know, it starts beeping because... 
um, a way to explain the um, rewards, the beep, is when you get the beep, it's like a game of hot or cool because we're shaping, right? So when you get the beep, it's telling your, telling your brain you're getting warmer. You're getting warmer to the pattern we want, right? And then when there's not a beep, it's you're getting colder. You're, you're getting off track from the, the uh, pattern that we want. So it helps. So the brain's going kind of in and out of that pattern we're trying to, um, we're trying to reinforce and we're trying to experience and repeat. Um, and that's happening with those, that image while you're sitting there. And I know it's, it, it's a kind of hard to make sense of that, how that can be happening, but that, that is how it's happening. It's, you know, biofeedback, and that's why that term gets used uh, at times, biofeedback for the brain, because other kinds of biofeedback um, that people are familiar with are um, uh, heart rate monitors, or um, you can take a thermometer, touch a thermometer to your finger, and you can measure your hand temperature. And so you see the temperature, you see the number there, so that's the feedback. And then you can actually decide to just relax, breathe deeper, calm yourself, and you'll look at that temperature and it'll start going up. So that's how you're actually changing your bodies, you know, changing something about your body just by having that, that feedback. So this is the same thing. It's just more complex because it's using a computer and it's your brain and, and, and that, but there's, you know, there's several functions of our body that we can, we do have control over. We can, we can change, even though a long time ago we thought that they were fixed and we couldn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been huge differences. There's sort of huge changes in the last even 10 years in the world of bio, uh, neural feedback. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, so hopefully it does become more mainstream um, and, you know, become, you know, a more, I don't want to say recognized, but a more, um, frequently used tool um, within the medical field. And I think that would open it up to a lot more people in terms of access because it is so, um, beneficial, you know, to everybody, to be honest. I think that we can all benefit from neurofeedback. Yes, definitely. And, um, and then, you know, again, that linked to the pandemic, because with the pandemic, we're, we're living in, in like a trauma state, right? Because we're constantly getting these messages, you know, we're not safe, we're not safe, it's not safe. And, and then we don't have the, the tools that we need to calm our nervous system to, you know, counter that message that we are safe because we have to social distance, we don't have the, the human interaction and, and then we can't, you know, do the activities that we used to do that used to help us manage our stress. And so, you know, that level is, is higher right now all around. So. And then people have, are experiencing, you know, their conditions have worsened that they already had, or people that, you know, weren't experiencing any problems before this suddenly are. Yeah. So, you know, it's a fantastic tool for moving forward for sure. Yeah. Um, so I have another member question and she asks, does the neurofeedback also incorporate breath work? and getting the heart rate down and maybe the use of calming imagery. I was told a home tool for biofeedback is the monitor that goes on your finger that reads your heart rate and blood oxygen level. Right, so that tool, um, that's yeah, what I was saying, an example of the other methods mm. of biofeedback that are there. And that helps you self-regulating um, self your nervous system, which of course is, affects you self-regulating um, your nervous system, your brain, your emotions, everything, you know? And that's something that you could do on a regular basis. Um, and some clients uh, I have that are, you know, need something extra, even in between our training sessions. I, you know, I do have some of those hand temperature training units. Um, I send them home with that to practice that in the meantime, in between sessions. Um, some people do meditate and that helps with their, with the neurofeedback. And um, I'm sorry, what was the, yeah, I just forgot the other thing that I was gonna talk about. 
in that question again? Go back. I'm just going to go back to that question. Okay, so the last part was, um, do you use uh, calming imagery? Right, and breath work, yes. Yeah, and breath work. Yeah. Um, I haven't been using calming imagery, but it can be used. Um, there's another protocol called alpha theta training that I didn't talk about today that you do with eyes closed. And it's, um, it's a bit of a, it's beyond the actual self-regulation uh, piece. It's something, it's what the optimal, I won't get into that, but anyways, um, yeah, it's, you need to be self-regulated before you do that because it can have some adverse um, reactions if you've mm -hmm. got some, um, uh, you've had trauma, you, you end up with some memories coming back that you might not be able to handle and that. So we wouldn't have anyone doing that kind of a protocol until they're self-regulated. So we can use those other tools to get to that state stage of self-regulation so that it's safer to do that, that protocol. Um, but breath work is a big one. Uh, I coach people on to um, exercises to work on at home again in between sessions to help help them calm. And then even with the neural feedback, like sometimes, you know, people are, um, you know, that yellow box is, gets really big. They really have trouble calming. You know, they might feel more nervous about doing the neural feedback. It might be just kind of hard to settle down, right? So then we do some breathing exercises then. Um, and it's, it's amazing how fast that works. And it's amazing once they see that too. I, I'll show them my screen and, you know, they see where the, where it was and then we do a little, breathing thing and then it comes right down and they can actually see that and that's very reinforcing too and finds to find that you know after that people realize okay well i can i can change this <laughs> yeah um so someone has asked how long are the sessions yeah the sessions are um an hour long like a psychotherapy session and they're approximately half um, the talking psychotherapy and half the actual um, training sessions. Now, the exercises um, on the screen, they run in uh, three minute increments. So there's mm -hmm. a period that'll run for three minutes. Um, there's a 10 second break and then another period will come for another three minutes based on how many it's been set up for. Right? So that very first sample training might be only three or six minutes. And then, um, and then once you get started with your protocol, um, once you um, you can see from the results that your brain is is picking it up and starting to organize around the um, the game, then uh, we can add time. So we can see based on the data the results of each training session whether um, it's you know this is the second period getting even better now we can add another one. If it's not, if it's getting worse, it's too soon to add another period. So we slowly add time. Some people. Um, that are very sensitive or especially when there's been brain injuries and concussions um, we never end up adding a lot of time they end up with shorter training um, but it's so effective so and it's just some brains you know like to run the marathon and they do well with that others just uh, you know less is more so and, and we know how to how to gauge that um, I'll talk about that side effects. There might be some side effects if we've done some overtraining. So that's when we know, okay, we don't, we should stop adding time here. Um, and how we know those people that, that need just a short training. Um, and then, so those actual exercises are only, you know, three minutes, six minutes, that sort of thing. But the actually getting set up, getting everything set up takes some time too. Um, so we have to, you know, put the sensors on, we have to check something called impedance. We have to wait for something called the artifact to come down. We have to wait for everything to be ready. And then we start. So there's a little bit of um, time spent, technical time too. <laughs> but side effects, yeah. so I'll just mention that because mm -hmm. you ask about that. Um, you know, the most you would get with a side effect is you do a training and we give you a little card of four key areas to pay attention to, to self-monitor for the next 48 hours. And those are um, your sleep, your uh, energy, your focus, and your mood. And just notice if anything's different in those four areas, or you might notice another area, but those are the key ones. And then, um, and then you report back on, on you know, how you 
what your experience was with that. And then some clients will say, well, nothing was different. It was, you know, same old, <laughs> um, especially after like a first training. But some people will say that they felt, um, they felt agitated. They felt, you know, more nervous. They had trouble falling asleep or, um, you know, their mood was kind of heightened. Or they're irritable or that, that type of thing. Um, that could be from the training being too long um, or that could be from the actual setup of the, um, there's, you know, standard frequencies, like I showed you that chart, that standard frequency of, uh, uh, of a beta, low beta is 12 to 15 hertz. And if that's what the reward was and the person had those side effects, that means that um, that reward is just a little too high for them. So we personalize it for them and bring it down, you know, to 11.5 to, um, 14.5 and, and see if that makes the difference. So we adjust frequencies to find the one that feels best and, uh, and go with that. And if there was that side effect, then it would only last for a day or two and then it would be gone. So, um, and it could go, side effect could be the other way too. It could be, you know, I slept too much. I felt down, you know, I didn't have focus. Then that would mean that that's too low for them. And we need to bump it up a little bit. So, that's the extent of the side effects. <laughs> so I guess is that like, um, for my own knowledge, is that kind of what they talk about when they uh, mention the term neural fatigue? Is that kind of the symptoms that you're describing? Sorry, did you say neural fatigue? Yeah. Is that kind of what you're, um, what you're talking about? Or is that something totally different? Uh, I think that's a little different. Like, I don't think when you've had those side effects well if it's the overtraining then then yeah i mean that's rare that's good that that's going to happen because we're doing that so gradually but you know that's something we've learned as a community actually to, you know um you know when neurofeedback was being done quite a while back you know it seemed like oh yeah yeah not less is more but more is more you know just keep adding time to run that marathon and then we started to realize well maybe that's not really necessary some people were maybe agitated after and having some negative experiences and and then we realized that okay that then that's overtraining but the other one is more that personalizing it's the sensitivity of that of uh, that brain um that those frequencies aren't uh, aren't comfortable for them and we want to find the sweet spot that's what's right for them mm -hmm. and of course it's it's going to work better it's going to be easier and it's going to have just the results are going to be just as good well better because we did the right the right thing yeah so it's very individualized yeah the only fatigue like people might feel a bit tired like we always check in you know how you know just tune into how you're feeling right now before we start and then after we're finished so how, how do things feel now you know what, what feels different and or what did you experience going through it um and you know a lot especially the calming protocols a lot of people at the end will say you know well i feel tired i feel like you know it feels like the equivalent of a physical workout so that's why that you know like three minutes can feel like an hour's physical workout <laughs> yeah so it's, you know, it's a different measurement, but, and then that kind of fatigue um, that the protocol might bring because it's calming, um, once you get up and you're moving around and that, that, you know, that dissipates. So yeah, it's just, you know, the brain's been working hard. That's all. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> this is kind of in the same vein, um, but I guess it's just a little bit more in depth. Um, someone has asked, how long does each neurofeedback screen last? And how many screens are in a session? How many average sessions for concussion? Okay, so the screen, um, well, as I mentioned, like the period will last for three minutes. The, the exercise will run for three minutes and then there's a pause for 10 seconds and then the screen changes and it, it shows you a bar graph. It shows you uh, how many beeps you got <laughs> in a graph format. And then it goes back and, and to the screen again, to that same, um, what that exercise look, looks like, but still always real time. You're not repeating what you just did. You're doing another three minutes of the exercise real time with your brain um and then um how many would we do well like that depends on if someone's doing you know six minutes would be two periods or if they're doing um 
I don't know, five periods and it's 15 minutes. Um, that would depend on the protocol and how long you've been training, if you've worked up to that. And some people don't need to work up to that, but yeah. And then the, um, sorry, the other question, sorry. <laughs> the other part okay. of that was- The other part of the question was, um, how many average sessions for a concussion? Right. Yeah, that's tricky, I'm not even sure. I think it's about the same, really, because it's not, um, the concussion has caused symptoms um, that we're working on, right, um, and that the neurofeedback is going to be helping with. Um, but whenever that concussion happened, the person also has a history of other things, other potential issues that are also going to be part of the work. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it also depends on how long ago that concussion was, because if you're just, um, yeah, it's a tricky one to answer. Because mm -hmm. you'll see, um, you know, can think of a recent um, situation where, yeah, we see the concussion symptoms improving, but sometimes when there's been a head injury, there's been person has a history of different injuries and some of them head injuries and some of them other injuries and, and we know that 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 is a statistic right that, that you know once you've had a head, head injury you're more prone to have more to have others and I don't know if that's because of the state of the brain that it's not as organized and um, there's that potential um, I'm not answering this very well so I, I think it's around the same but someone could benefit if they were just looking for some immediate relief for some of the worst symptoms and they might not do you know a full 40 sessions or something but they would still get some benefits so it's kind of the best i can answer that yeah i mean i suppose it would be again just individualized you know mm -hmm. but it's interesting to note that um you know you wouldn't necessarily have to do all of the sessions that um you know there are other I guess, plans or um, amounts of sessions that could still be beneficial, just at least for the... Um, yes. yes, and I mean, that happened, I got a great example, again, with the pandemic, because the neurofeedback clients I had that I wasn't able to see in person anymore for for several months because of that lock, first lockdown, um, about coming back, I mean, they didn't want to do therapy online because they just they were especially interested in continuing the neurofeedback. Mm -hmm. And then um, when it was time to come back, um, not all of them came back. And, but they did have the benefit, the benefit that they had gained from doing it, you know, before all this happened, they still had. And some of them, because I was in touch with them a little bit along the way, they did make those comments of, you know, the benefits that they had from doing the neurofeedback before were actually helpful in helping them cope with all of this. Wow. Um, they didn't keep going, but they, they found that it had been helpful. So. I think that's huge though. Yeah. Uh, and the next, sorry, <laughs> my well, apologies. Some people, if they have, I mean, and then the other thing with the pandemic was there were some people that started and, and couldn't keep going as long as they wanted to because of circumstances mm. around all of this. Um, but, uh, they were very happy with the progress that they made and they did it, you know, explain to them that they weren't going to lose anything, right, by stopping at that point, like whatever gains they've made, they're not, they're not going to be taken away, right? So, you know, there's nothing to lose by doing this. Yeah. yeah. Let me just look here. So someone is asking, would this be helpful for a stroke patient with multiple symptoms like loss of balance, loss of sensation on one side, and severe pain? causing sleep issues and stress. Uh, yes, it could help with all of those things. And um, the things with concussion, stroke, brain injury, uh, things we need to look at, um, we do look at when we do assessment is, you know, when those things happen, how long ago they were, 
because if someone's coming, you know, at what point is someone coming to do this? So if it's very soon after the injury, it might be too soon. It might be too much too soon. Um, mm -hmm. They might need a different, they might need to wait some time or um, a different approach because there are a few other biofeedback systems that are different, as I mentioned a bit earlier, like that are, um, there's a low frequency, uh, um, there's, what's the name of that one? Stim? Yeah, there's, there's a few other types of units that are diff different that they might do first. And I've um, heard about cases where they've done some of that first and then they switch to more of the learning um, neurofeedback. So mm -hmm. that would require, um, you know, meeting and discussion and uh, whether or not they've had an EEG, um, what a neurologist has said, like what, you know, what their medical um, details are, you know. Yeah. You know, we uh, have to be informed, well-informed, you know, to make the right choices there, yeah. Um, somebody had a question, but they, I guess they need to leave because they're not here now. I'm going to go to the next person. Um, so I guess this person is asking for some clarification. So technically, you use the neural feedback to help the therapy session by putting the person into the window of tolerance where it is safer to open up and talk about issues and traumas? Um, that's true, yep. Yeah. Um... So what happens with, um, yeah, with trauma is then, you know, there's a few things that we notice. Like if we're doing the talk psychotherapy first before doing the neurofeedback in, in that one hour session, we start with that and we're talking about things and something has happened and the person's talking about that and they're getting activated um, by explaining that. Then, you know, we, we go through that process and then sit down and do the neurofeedback. And then, so there's some release from actually having that discussion. And then after doing the training, then there's even more of a release, you know, there's that physiological calming. Um, so yeah, so it does work as a tool that way. And uh, it also works, you know, um, I guess that's on our website as well, kind of helping to prepare you for therapy. So some people that um, are having trouble with talk psychotherapy, having, uh, trouble talking about their experiences because it's too overwhelming and, and they can't really organize their their thoughts and they can't stay out of the you know the flashbacks and things like that then um, the neurofeedback can help them and then they might you know there's going to be psychotherapy with it but then they might continue af after they've done their neurofeedback with more psychotherapy to continue processing and it will be easier and less activating and they can work through those traumas continue to work through those traumas. Um, or the other way around, some people who's, who might have had a brain injury or a trauma or um, are being uh, in a program where they're trying to have them do CBT or something and they, they can't make head or tail of it because their brain is so disorganized. They come in, they do neurofeedback and they go, okay, now I understand CBT because <laughs> their brain starts um, being more organized and able to uh, to handle that cognitive um, challenge. So, so, you know, there's different places to insert neurofeedback. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is one member who um, is not here, but um, I'm just gonna read out his, uh, his comment um, and kind of his, uh, I guess, musings, his questions. Um, his comment is, how does one even try to navigate from a post brain injury during COVID? How can I feel or understand and determine where my physical or mental state is at? I have no measuring stick anymore. Am I better than pre-COVID or slipping post-COVID? I just want to eat ice cream. <laughs> mm. So I guess a lot of people are really um, just struggling, you know, and having that, I guess the difference pre and post injury is, is such a difficult thing to measure, you know, especially during um, a pandemic. Right. So the, yeah, that would depend on, yeah, what measurements were there, what that, what information data that person has from, um, from the time of their injury and their uh, getting of their recovery, like 
what whoever was helping them at that point um and then yeah and then the pandemic so then you know you might have had some kind of a um forecast i know that's the wrong word for <laughs> progress for you know things will proceed progress report something like that um uh and then you know with the pandemic it, like that wouldn't be very um feasible with i mean based on adding that to the mix so yeah it would be hard to know am i doing better or am i doing worse because you've got this extra this extra piece so that would be you know doing some counseling or doing um you know whatever modality uh of you know of help of mental health help to find out you know where you're at i mean you could do some um with a therapist, some indexes possibly, the depression index, the anxiety index, just something just to see maybe where you're at. I mean, you might not have had a pre one of those, but you know, mm -hmm. you can do it now and then possibly work on some tools, work with some tools to try to um, uh, help get through this. And then along the way, you know, uh, revisit those, those indexes and see if things have improved. That's the one way. I'm wondering, just out of that discussion, um, earlier in your presentation, you talked about some tools, um, external from neurofeedback and psychotherapy. Um, I'm wondering if somebody um, was in a position where neurofeedback is not accessible at this point in time, um, would some of those tools be beneficial um, to a person as they, um, are trying to navigate access. Yeah, so um, some learning. Um, well, I mean, the tools that I, I mentioned were uh, breath work exercises, um, the, you know, the hand temperature training or any other kind of um, consumer product that you might want to use there's the muse for meditating which is a, a headband that does give you a little bit of feedback of when your mm. brain's in a calm state and when it's um, not and when it's recovering so it kind of helps you really see what you're doing in your in uh, meditating um, uh, what else you know there's different there's bottom up things to calm your nervous system so like things like yoga and you know they're coming up with a lot of different um, learning different exercises. I do also use um, SSP, which is um, a sensory, sorry, I'm running out of steam here. Sensory sound, <laughs> safe and sound protocol. There we go, <laughs> SSP, um, which is related to the, uh, or came out of the polyvagal theory. So Stephen Porges has um, designed this. There's a place called the Listening Center in Toronto. Um, there's a system, you know, that system's been around for a while, but, um, you know, it's been improved upon and there's so much available now so that we can take it online. So it can be available as an app and people can, you know, use it remotely. Um, so that helps to calm the nervous system. And I've done the training in that and I do have the, um, um, the membership. So uh, for clients that I am seeing online and can't come in for neurofeedback, I'm trying to get some of them using that because it can help um, in the meantime, just by listening to music, help to uh, calm the nervous system, because the music has been processed and filtered in a way that's um, triggering the central nervous system to um, feel safe and help to change from the parasympathetic to the sympathetic and um, uh, calm things down. Yeah. So that's, oh, that's good. yeah. And there's, um, you know, there's a number of people that have, um, have that, uh, have that to offer. So that's, you can probably find them online too. That's great to know. Mm -hmm. Cause I know that there's a lot of people right now who, um, you know, are struggling to access certain supports because there's so many barriers currently um, especially with the pandemic. Um, but some people, you know, they live with barriers, um, you know, as part of their day-to-day -day life. And so trying to yeah. uh, get around or remove some of those barriers is super helpful. Um, and the other thing is the, um, the system that we use is called EEGER, E-E-G, 
EER, which stands for EEG, Education and Research. <laughs> um, but they have always had like a home system, but it was, um, it was a challenge to navigate. I mean, I had never navigated it yet, but um, they tried to make it more and more user-friendly, more and more affordable. So they had been working on that through the pandemic so that people could still get neural feedback. I mean, it is still challenging, of course, to put the sensors on yourself and <laughs> try to do all that yourself from home. Um, but, you know, it's a possibility for, you know, if somebody really wanted to do that, you know, the, make that happen um, and then the cost is uh, so they have packages for renting so you you know you pay for for that to have the system um, until until it's time to return it and then you know and then I would work with the person online um, to you know make that happen I mean it's best if you could have at least a few sessions in person and then mm -hmm. you know work on it from home and then you can do it more frequently too yeah that's true actually <laughs> I have another question that just popped up. Um, this one is, oh, this is interesting. What hertz level would be good to listen to with YouTube music for brain injury? Or does it vary from person to person? Well, it varies. Now there is a lot of stuff on YouTube about um, a lot of music uh, and trainment. So it's basically music with certain frequencies that help you know, provide that to your brain so that it'll start to um, resonate with that frequency, which then again makes, you know, makes you feel calmer. So there's going to be, you know, some of them are alpha, some of them, there's ones that are, you know, to help you study, ones to help you sleep, ones to help you. Uh, so it would be best to be one that's calming. Um, so, you know, that's usually theta. Uh, so it's theta and probably some alpha. So those would be the ones. And then there's a lot of that already kind of packaged up on YouTube if you um, look for that. I wouldn't have even thought of that. That was a great question, actually. Yeah, it's pleasant. I remember checking that out for studying for my big exam. <laughs> ah, <laughs> listen to some music. That'll help, help me learn all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still kind of new to the uh, the effects of uh, music on, um, I guess your your mind or your yeah your self regulation essentially. Right. Um, so I think it's yeah it's it's still I'm still new to it, but it's very fascinating how how we respond to things. Um, a little bit separate, but I know that uh, meditation um, has suddenly added a musical component to it, which is, it's very interesting. It's kind of helpful though, because I think that, you know, like neurofeedback, it provides that guide, um, you know, either verbally or musically, um, which I think that is probably the, uh, the thought process behind it, but I found that really interesting. Right. So I wonder if they use something, you know, music along those same lines. I wonder if it's similar. People creating music, you mean? Just, I'm not sure um, if it's their own or if it's um, other people's licensed music, but they're putting it, um, so on YouTube, you can have guided meditation um, and they're, in, they're incorporating a musical component to that. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of that, like, um, I guess it's not new because a long time ago they would use like sound baths. So I suppose it's not new, but it's still kind of in that modality. It's new to me. Right. Yeah. Cause meditation you usually think of quiet and stillness, right? Like music maybe in a guided visualization or something like that, but yeah. It's mm -hmm. So during um, a neurofeedback session, would you be speaking to the person who is doing the neurofeedback or would it be a quieter environment? Yes, while we're doing it, um, uh, we're not, like once it's ready to start, then we're not speaking because the, the uh, equipment is very sensitive. So as I mentioned, you know, when we're first getting set up, you know, there's a number we need to reach for 
to have the impedance down. So that means nothing's getting in the way up here of the signal, hair isn't in the way or whatever. So we've actually got a good signal. And then we look at, uh, we see artifact on the equipment as well. We have to wait for that to come down. So mm -hmm. artifact would be, if we're talking, we're gonna create a lot of artifact. Artifact that you know, shows up when your eyes are blinking, if you move, um, muscle tension shows up in the signal. So we wanna have, you know, be, be, it to be still and quiet so that we're just getting the, the signals from the brain and not a lot of a lot of other stuff so and you want to be focused on the, the task right so yeah <laughs> you know, if, there's, if there's problems and again it's so personalized so i guess that's another point with concussions sometimes when i said you know less is more sometimes it's really less sometimes it's like we'll go for a minute we want to go for the whole three minute period go for a minute and i'll pause and check in with you and see how things are going and i'm actually seeing how things are going there too right so and then you know we take a little break and then we come back to it so um so it can be it can be a little bit interactive sometimes or if there's a lot of jaw tension and you know we just can't get that fast wave down and we might talk about that do some breath some breathing or you know just uh, focus on relaxing the jar or whatever seems to be in the way so yeah mm -hmm. i guess in that sense it's important to like that's where the um the administrator i'm not sure how how to label the person delivering the neurofeedback um but i guess that would be the importance of having that person so that they can um, ensure that the right conditions are being set to have the most benefit yeah and i do that myself like as a therapist i do all of it but in some larger centers um they have uh, neurofeedback technicians so you know mm. you'd be with with a therapist or psychologist um, for part of the time and then actually a technician will set you up and run the session so i mean they'll know a little bit about how to interact if needed right <laughs> but um yeah so we don't do it that way so. And this is the last question for the evening. Um, how long, this is just, uh, this is kind of my question actually, um, out of curiosity, how long has biofeedback been around? Oh, I can't remember the exact number from those history. <laughs> it's been around a long time, um, decades. I can't remember if it's the 30s or the 40s, um, you know, in stages, like, you know, there was the EEG was discovered and then um, using uh, biofeedback for uh, to help stop seizures was um, was a big uh, a big milestone along the way. Then it was being used for um, uh, uh, relaxation and addictions. Like there were some key players along the way that um, did some uh, exploration and thus studies and showed results. So that's how we ended up with this long list of things that you can, you can work with it on. But yeah, the very first was um, seizures. Wow. Epilepsy, yeah. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, from that slide, when we talked uh, about our little faces covering those, the two boxes that were being covered were actually depression and addiction. Depression and addiction, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Just for anybody who, who was curious. Right. Um, so I'm going to end the community meeting now. And I just want to, once again, I really want to thank Annette Bradshaw for coming out today. Um, I think it was a fabulous evening. I learned so much and I hope all of you did as well. Um, we've left the information um, here just so that you can go ahead and you can check out her website. Um, feel free to email her with any questions. Um, she is fabulous to sit and chat with. Um, so I know that she would be more than happy to answer any of your questions that you may have. Um, and again, thank you to all the members for coming out tonight. Um, and we will see you again next month. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Annette.